So let's talk about folks who are listening to this who yeah. want to boost their VO2 max. Let's talk about Correct. the different protocols that exist. So I'll tell you what we typically uh, tell, yeah. tell patients to do, which is kind of, in my experience, one of the most efficient ways that you can do it. But I'm curious as to what other ways. So we typically talk about a four by four, or four on four. Yeah, no, protocol. you're right there. So, so we'll yeah. tell people. Um, and again, the easiest way that I personally can do this is on a bike on an incline. Yep. And it can't be a very steep incline. It's got to be like 6% grade. I want to yep. stay in the saddle. and But I never want the resistance to go away. And I basically want to be in the saddle climbing against Correct. resistance for four minutes. And I use a power meter and a heart rate. So I just want to keep the power as steady as I can. Invariably, it dips in about the third yep. minute. And then I can yep. recover it in the fourth minute psychologically. And then the recovery is four minutes of literally doing nothing but rolling back to the starting right. line. And then so, it's so, basically just repeat that. So, so, so yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm with you. What I tell people, for example, that have come and say, I want to run a faster marathon. I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, and they're running a lot of miles. They need to get their VO2 max up. And I tell them exactly what you've described. Sometimes I tell them five minutes and three minutes rest, sometimes whatever. And people that are fitter sometimes only take, like I would only take two minutes of rest. Okay. And that's just, but four times four is terrific. So you would do something if you were thinking about running. I would tell people to do something that would be right at their sort of 5K race pace. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little faster or or you would do the first one a little slower than your 5K race pace. The next one, you know, a little faster than that. The next one a little faster. The next one faster than your 5K race pace. And depending on how fast you're running, if you're going pretty fast, then you would just jog in between. And if you were were not going so fast, you'd walk in between. So that would be the sort of thing that, that I would describe to people. And the, the classic training, you know, among elite runners is is mile repeats. You know, people doing, you know, four or five times one mile, and then they jog a, a quarter mile or a half mile in between. And I, I personally have seen really good runners. I mean, it's I've seen people, you know, do, you know, 430, 425, 420, 415, 410, 405. Which is, but I mean, these were people getting ready for the Olympics, you know. So, 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 but, but those sorts of things. But, so, but sort of for the average person, right? You know, the the hard part that I think requires a little bit of coaching up front is, yep. it's, it, you know, you and I have done this our whole lives, so we sort of Correct. know what four minutes all out feels like. Yeah, it's right. Like, exactly. At, at, at Thirty seconds in, you shouldn't be hurting too much. If you no, are, and CP, you've gone out yeah. too hard. So, so it takes a little bit of work to, to coach learn somebody how to, do to it. understand what you're, what you're going for is a constant four minutes. But the but the suffering is disproportionately in the last ninety seconds. And Peter, you've, you're you're exactly right. So let, I describe it as you, when you're done, when you get done with the last one, the fourth one, you do not want to be bending over. You if you'd have gone a little bit of faster, you'd want to be bending over. So, you, so I call it the no bend over rule. Mm, interesting. And then what people have to recognize, both for the four times four minutes and within the four minutes, is a good interval workout. And this sounds uh, you know completely masochistic is like putting your hand in warm water and then slowly increasing the temperature in the water to where you can barely stand it anymore and then leave it in for a while. <laughs> and then you turn it down and let your hand cool off and do it again. And, and that's really the, the, what you described. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, one of the things I, I think we've learned from the cyclists is a terrific phrase called manage your suffering. You know, you need to learn to manage your suffering. And 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 uh, and I think that's the other interesting thing about this type of training in, in, um, is, is to the extent, you know, people can have these sort of religious experiences <laughs> exercising, uh, this sort of interval training is one way to get them. That's what I would tell you. I, no, I completely agree. I mean, obviously, we're cut from the same cloth in this way. But, but I think that yeah. um, there really is something wonderful about experiencing your limits and understanding Correct. that level of discomfort. And if you're able to maintain your rhythm and tempo, Peter, while you do it, that's when you can have these sorts of experiences. And, and um, you know, I mean, one of the most beautiful things ever, and it wasn't a total endurance athlete, you know, event, it was a little bit short, a couple of minutes, but to watch Michael Phelps swim the butterfly and watch his stroke, he was, a, he was good at everything, but he was especially good at the butterfly. 
And to watch, you know, most people's stroke is falling apart and they end up taking more strokes the last 50 of a 200 meter butterfly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his stroke count, the second, third, and fourth lap didn't change because he had that rhythm, that tempo. And if you listen to the old school coaches talk about interval training, they're constantly talking about tempo. What is your rhythm? What is your tempo? And, and why you're doing it, why you're suffering, Peter, why you're pushing it while, while, while it's hurting, while it's burning. The goal was to not lose your form and not lose your tempo. You know, it's funny. I used to, I used to watch Michael Phelps train because uh, before he yeah. kind of broke out in the early 2000s, yeah. um, I lived in Baltimore because I did my residency sure. at Hopkins and he used to train at a place called North Baltimore Aquatic. Yeah, right. Uh, NBAC. Yeah. So, so watching now michael of course within the swimming world was already uh, an unbelievable yeah. prodigy because he he had gone to the olympics in sydney placed at age like 15 or something yeah, which is he, quite young for a man that's right I mean, he was actually the youngest uh he, he became the youngest male to ever set a world right. record in a time sport in early 01 well, correct uh, when he I set the he record for 15 the, yeah, yeah set the record for the 200 fly so so watching this 16 year old swimming at uh, North Baltimore Aquatic NBAC, um, which his signature event, of course, was the 200 fly. Now it's 200 Correct. long course butterfly. I would put that up there with the 200 breast and the 400 IM as the three worst races in all of swimming. To me, it's like doing an 800 meter intermediate hurdles on the track. The event doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, it's pure, it's insane suffer. But here's the thing, Mike, his training was almost never, you never once saw him do a 200 uh, right. fly. It was lots of 75s, right. lots of 75s. And uh, his coach, Bob Bowman, was really adamant about perfect form. Because if I Correct. recall, Michael had an unusual rhythm, which is that he breathed on every stroke. And usually, like when I swam butterfly, when most people swam butterfly, it was every other. You would you Correct. Were head underwater for one stroke, head up for yep. one, down for one. And, and Michael, I, I'm pretty sure he would breathe every stroke, but as you pointed out, no one's form could rival his. And that's why he, he was usually the last guy to hit the wall at the 50 and, and, and yet would come Correct. back and he, just devour he, everybody. Well, and you see that with Edwin Moses, 13 steps between hurdles and the 400 hurdles in the late seventies with that innovation. And, and again, you, you see these people, you saw it with Kipchoge doing it for two hours, their ability to maintain this form and tempo and as you watch it, as you watch it, Peter, you you are awed by this sense of great effort and simultaneous relaxation. It's really it's a real paradox. <laughs> and 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 and, when, and again, you see that you see that in other sports too. You see it when the, when the golfers get hot, how how far they hit the ball, but it, it's it's both violent and relaxed at the same time. You you certainly uh, you know you you sit there and watch Steph Curry or Clay Thompson start launching balls. And, 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 and it's just incredible, the tempo, the rhythm, the form, and, 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 but, uh, and the effort. But again, just how relaxed they are. It's just wild to think about even. Now, going back to our very, very recreational yeah, yeah. person who's never trained in their life, we, we don't even, we don't use lactate testing on people at that yeah. level. We basically do the whole thing off RPE. And we try to get 80% of their time, which might start out at, two to three hours per week as we want you to be able to talk, but not enjoy it. Right. I don't want you to be any, I don't want you to be any higher than that. Right. And then once we build up a bit of a reserve in that, after maybe six months of that kind of training, we're sort of ready to move them to that next phase of, Hey, once a week, I want you to do kind of four on four off Correct. four rounds. Um, do you think that once a week doing those four hard intervals is sufficient to boost VO2 max? It will increase it for sure Yeah, in the vast majority of people, especially if they're doing the other stuff you're talking about. Uh -huh. and, and I think that, that what I really like about what you describe and what people don't realize, especially when you're going to advocate relatively hard training for citizens, is that sometimes you have to train before you can really train. Yeah, that's right. You got to train to train. Yeah, yeah, you you got to get, and you certainly have seen that in some some uh, uh, studies with, with older you know people that are really you know 60, 70 years old is that they almost have to do three or four or six months of sort of pre training before they are fit enough to train hard. So I, I think you're spot on there, and I my guess is after they they've been able to do it for you know once a week for a while, you build them up to two 
times per week. I, I think the one thing that people need to recognize, and this comes from a man named Stan James, who I think is still practicing medicine. He's in his 90s, was a one of the pioneers of sports medicine, orthopedic surgery, and I, he's not operating anymore. But he, the last I checked, he was alive and well out in Eugene, Oregon. And, and he he worked with Coach Bill Bowerman, you know, the the great Oregon coach, uh, one of the founders of Nike, the waffle shoe guy. You know, and they got into this hard easy thing, which is is sort of what I do. And I and and uh, you, you know, Dr. James would tell you that once people start doing more than about five or six hard hard sessions every two weeks, you're beginning to ask for some sort of load management issue, whether it's orthopedics, whether it's just you're fatigued, whether it's this, whether it's that. So I do think that that um, you you, know, you want to do something literally. I mean, I can't remember the last day I didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You know, it's probably been you know years, but 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 my guess is the the number of times I do something hard is you know 120, 130 times per year, and I and my guess is I I never go more than a week without doing something relatively intense. 